Ladies and gentlemen of the press, it is a true honor to welcome Da Aung San Suu Kyi, a member of parliament of the Union of Burma, founder of the National League for Democracy, Nobel Peace Prize winner, a symbol of peace throughout the world. Ladies and gentlemen, Da Su will have about 10 minutes to answer your questions. I welcome you personally. It's an honor to introduce you. And who would like to ask the first question? Da Su, could you speak about how your spiritual life has informed your political activism? I've never thought of myself as having a spiritual life apart from my work. It's part of my work. I approach my work as a whole person, and that includes the spiritual strength I may have and other strengths. Why do you think Burma, Myanmar, became sort of a focal point for the work for peace? around the world? Do you think it's a focal point for the world for peace? I think it's just that people see my country now as a place where we can succeed, where there can, there can be a happy ending, because things to be, seem to be heading to, in the right direction. I don't think things are as easy as that. I've always been a very cautious optimist, and I think we have to work very hard before we can get Burma to where we want it to go. But I've never thought of it as a focal point of peace. I think perhaps because of the ethnic conflict within the country, people are interested in trying to, to achieve peace for us. But we have to do it for ourselves. Dasu, would you excuse me for a moment? I want to know if you can get closer to the mic. Is it on? It might be on. She's personally fine. Shora, can you hear me? How do you think trouble hearing you? Does anyone know how this mic works? It's on. It's, it's on. on. It's fine. It's on. Okay. Can you darling, lean in? darling. She's going to lean in. It's thank fine. you. I'm leaning as far as possible. Yeah. Very good. <laughs> thank you. Hello, thank Lindy. You. <laughs> can you share with us um, one of the main points of your speech? It's right at my newspaper's deadline. Oh. Uh, well, it's peace, I suppose. <laughs> 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 Uh, your work is so inspiring to all people who are seeking for freedom and uh, seeking to end the dictatorship. Uh, I'm from a Chinese TV station. It's a station for the people. It's based in the U.S. Can you speak a few words for two people who are incarcerated in China, in the Chinese prison, people who are fighting for freedom to end the dictatorship of the Chinese Communist Party? I wouldn't like to speak of the freedom of people in any particular place. I think I would like to speak about freedom in general. Uh, people should have freedom of conscience. They should be able to follow their beliefs as far as possible. And I think everybody should help one another. People talk about prisoners of conscience. And I think a prisoner of conscience is somebody who believes in what she or he is doing and does it because of his or her belief. And if we respect their beliefs, then we have a moral ob obligation to stand up for them and to stand with them. And that stands for prisoners of conscience anywhere, everywhere. Dr. Yeah. there are so many people here in Hawaii who think that Burma is so far away, it's a distant country. What can people here do to help the cause for democracy in your country? At this juncture, I keep repeating that the best thing people can do is to keep up an awareness of what's really going on in Burma. Not to be over-optimistic, and yet to know that this is a time of opportunity for my country, and to help it as far as possible in the right way. Help has to be given in the right way if we have to go in the right direction. Now, I have a follow-up question on China. Um, uh, do, you, do you have any thoughts or expectations on the old and new relationship with China? Because Beijing will have a new leadership, and now we are in Hawaii. The United States is talking about the Pacific century. Do you think the strong partnership between the U.S. and Myanmar will have sort of impact or change on the old, long-time relationship between China and Myanmar? Thank you. Uh, I sh shouldn't think it would change. Because you have to remember that we always had very good, a very good relationship with China from the very beginning of the communist government there. At that time, Burma was a practicing democracy. Not a perfect one, but it was a working democracy. But even then, we maintained very good relations with our neighbors, including China, while we were very, very close to the Western countries and Western nations which were helping us to develop as a newly independent nation. I don't think it's an exclusive relationship. It doesn't mean that we have to be 
friends with either the United States or with China. We can be friends with both, and we need to be friends with, with both because China is a neighbor, and because the United States is a very, very powerful nation, eager to help emerging democracies. So, so you, I'm with you. Um, your father fought for independence of, of Burma, and you have um, sacrificed so much over the years with nonviolence. Um, meanwhile, in this country, we have um, voting where we have barely half the population votes, and we seem to take democracy and freedom for granted. What would you say to the people of Hawaii and the United States about the meaning of democracy and after everything you've been through? I keep telling people that if they do not exercise their democratic responsibilities, they may find that these, uh, their, their rights get eroded. Uh, we have to be aware of how lucky we are if we happen to have democratic rights. When I was uh, in, uh, living in England, I was appalled at the fact that uh, many of my friends neglected to go to vote at the time. And I would tell them, I've never had the chance to go to the free election. Why are you not using your vote? And if you don't use your vote, if you don't use your democratic rights, it's failing in your democratic responsibilities. And everybody has a responsibility to uphold the kind of society in which they want to live. So I would urge everybody to take their responsibility very seriously. I'm very old fashioned. Responsibility before rights is our <laughs> Yes. Josu, I'm with Voices of Women. And I wonder in your cabinet, do you have vision and placement for the women of Burma to work toward the peacemaking? We've tried to involve women as far as much as possible in politics. And of course, peacemaking is a political process. Um, for example, when we contested the violence <coughs> last year, we tried to put in as many women candidates as possible. It was not a satisfactory number, but we have almost doubled the numbers of women candidates, of women representatives in our parliament. So we haven't done too badly, but nothing like as well as I would have been. We really need more women who can get involved in politics and who are willing to get involved in politics. Dr. So, how did it feel to win the Nobel Prize? Well, it didn't feel like anything at all because I heard about <laughs> 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 um, it. Was, uh, well, they've been talking about it for a week or two beforehand, and I knew I was one of the front runners. So it wasn't a total surprise. And when they announced it on the radio, I simply thought, well, so they chose it. Okay. What practice do you do to maintain a personal sense of peace when you're surrounded by so much conflict? Well, of course, I do meditate, but I don't have as much time to meditate now as I used to at the house arrest. You know, one of the advantages of house arrest is that you have a lot of time for meditation. But I think uh, I, I seek peace through work. It's, I don't think of myself as surrounded by conflict. I think of myself as somebody with a very, very tight schedule, with a lot of work to accomplish each day. And by getting through it each day, I gain satisfaction. And satisfaction gives one sense of peace. What encourages people to believe in peace, and especially youth, in this process? I was once talking to a young man, and uh, he had uh, family problems, and he said to me that all he wanted was peace of mind. And it, it, uh, it made me feel very sad, because when I was his age, I never thought of peace of mind. I took it for granted that I could do whatever I liked in this world, that I could go to whichever place I wanted to, that there were so many choices open to me. I realized that, of course, that not all young people are equally lucky. I think young men and women should not need to think about peace. If they need to think about peace, there's something wrong with their society. There's something wrong with their family situation, their social situation. Because the young should be so full of confidence and uh, energy and uh, expectations and choices that they do not think of peace as the most important element in their lives. That's very natural, but as you grow older, you learn to value peace. So the young must also understand the necessity for peace, the drive for peace, which I think they're beginning to, because there's so much turmoil in the world we live in, that more and more young people understand the value of peace, which is a good thing.
Tarsus, North Korea has taken a very offensive posture against the United States. How should we as a country react to that? Do you believe? North Korea has taken a very offensive posture toward us. How should we react to that as a country? I think you should find out why they have adopted this offensive posture, if this is how you see it. Because I always believe in asking the question why. Uh, recently, I've been discussing the matter of corruption in Burma quite a lot with high officials. And uh, many of them say, well, if there's proof that somebody has been corrupt, has been engaging in corrupt practices, and, there's a, and you can provide evidence, we shall sack them. And I said, you know, it's not just a matter of sacking people who have been corrupt. We've got to find out why so many of our civil servants are corrupt. And we've got to try to correct the situation. Actually, if we were to uh, sack all the civil servants in Burma who are corrupt, we'd be left with very few. <laughs> so we have to find out why they were obliged to engage in bribery and corruption in the first place, which is because we're very ill paid and then it becomes a practice. So I think uh, offen an offensive posture has a lot to do with uh, necessity to defend oneself in some way. So I think behind offense is always some kind of fear, mistrust, lack of understanding. You have to work to change those. So, so um, in keeping a good relationship with China, how can Burma help to encourage opening up and democracy in China and, and the dictatorship in China? I don't think it's Burma alone which would be able to bring changes to a big and, and ancient country like China. It's the people of China themselves who will decide in which direction they want the country to go. I think it would be very presumptuous of me to think that Burma could tell China where it should go. I mean, how can Burma, uh, Burma help the Chinese people to gain their rights? Maybe that's a way to <coughs> ask well, the question. Well, again, I would, like, I would not like to think of it as helping a particular people or a particular country. And uh, we are just starting out on the road to democracy. We haven't even got there. Uh, we can't stop thinking about how we're going to help other people achieve democracy when we haven't yet achieved it ourselves. What are some yes. of the daily struggles that your people go through every day. How limited are they in terms of expressing their thoughts? Uh, well, before you think about, uh, you, you, you were saying daily struggles. Daily struggles in Burma uh, involve things like lack of water, lack of good roads, lack of electricity. Uh, there's a lack of a lot of things. And you may think that I'm only talking about material things. But these are basic, basic needs for a lot of people. And uh, freedom of thought, I think, Freedom of thought in, in many ways is a habit. You have to learn to think. This is why I said you must ask the question, why? I'm always telling the members of my party, you must learn to ask questions. You must ask, quest you must ask the question, why? You must not accept that things are just as they are. If you want to change things, you must get at the root of the problem. Get at the root of the problem. And I think people are very quick to catch on to this. Uh, as far as possible, I have uh, even when I'm addressing large public meetings, I try to get one or two people in the crowd to ask questions, to speak up, to, to engage with them, rather than just to talk at them. Thank you so much. And we appreciate it. If I could just ask, because I think everybody would like to know, what is your, um, how do you see your future, your political future in, in Burma, and your role in it? A bright one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>